Hello everyone, today we introduce Northern French warfare between the 11th and the 14th century. This is for the original warfare series and we have dedicated um, this content normally to the, of course, depiction of the basic military characteristics of these countries' armies, however also blending that with the influences coming from the surrounding regions so that you can virtually follow a map right from stretching uh, across the entire uh, Eurasia uh, of all these various cultures and their characteristics and in fact we concentrated even more on these interference between one culture and another and then even the 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 central core that we anyhow discuss but both in, in these videos and in many others that we dedicate in, in depth, in detail um, to the, say battles, uh, unit types, army organization, tactics in general. All right. So when we come to Northern France, we essentially, as far as broader Western warfare is concerned, to the very cradle of the fundamentals, of the essentials, what eventually is known as medieval Europe, especially feudal Europe, uh, as a whole, given that from northern France, for reasons that today I will not digress on in retrospectively up to, to, to this point in, in time, starting from the 11th century, um, literally overflowed uh, in, in the wider surroundings. This had already been seeded in the post-Carolingian kingdoms and from the 11th century you have this expanding towards uh, England, Sicily, northern Spain, the Levant uh, and, and more because this thing keeps pouring out um, broader civilizational influence and albeit surrounding countries do have their own important military output um, and characteristics, would say peculiar uh, feature on uh, on their own. We can say that northern France r literally emanates this broader glue that will make what we intend as as Western civilization sort of compacting together and strengthening on the basis also of these differences. So it's difficult to introduce such an enormous topic. I already made a video about medieval southern French warfare during the same period. Today we'll look again at the uh, apotheosis of Western heavy cavalry, feudal system, uh, and of course other elements that were interspersed in here and there also in, in northern France was not absolutely homogeneous uh, just in of itself. Right, there is a pretty hefty medieval France playlist by now, so if you're interested in, in the broader nuanced picture you can find plenty of stuff uh, there. We will surely dedicate at some point to, I don't know, uh, the warfare of Britannia or the specificities of, of Normandy or Flanders. Today we will just touch on them superficially, but still connecting them with th this broader center mostly revolves around um, today's north eastern France. There was a lot of that also in, for example, western Belgium and in fact um, that's why I can't digress on the past because everything would be clearer but again if you followed my content and or you have a basic uh, understanding of medieval warfare on a regional um, level right of the, the various characteristics you, you know where this stemmed from this was essentially the Frankish heartland in at least the you know the, the Merovingian imperial sense not much just one of the origins of, of the people and in fact also a bit of geography here is necessary to understand what we're talking about because these territories uh, have changed hands politically over the centuries and the frontiers of northern and eastern France during this period in fact were very different from the modern country for example if we look at the mid 11th century as a start date the county of Flanders um, in what is today's western Belgium formed part of the same kingdom of France right? but the Flemish uh, regions of Brabant and Hainaut I made recently a video about medieval Brabant that were located in the eastern part of historical Flanders are today forming part of Belgium yes but 
at the time they laid within the Holy Roman Empire. And you can argue that there were important differences historically, in fact, between probably the even just the Romance part and, and the Germanic one. Um, Champagne, as well, I made a bit about the county was within France, the major principality in the northeast, but in fact, it wasn't per se under the control of the French crown, so the possessions at this point of the Capetian dynasty that mostly um, were based in, in the Ile de France, but not only because the French crown had, of course, the public capacity of coalescing some further power by controlling directly different and strategic locations, sometimes even single cities, certain islands within a broader, otherwise you know, vassalatic, princely territories that were politically quite self-aware of their privilege and, and power. All right? We don't make today even a, a history of, say, Western Frankish politics just per se, but you know what we're talking about, right? Feudalism is already pretty pushed at this point, at least we would have fully developed for us to call it like this, uh, ideally, and um, France was the largest and also most powerful altogether um, countering Europe, yet it was very politically fragmented because um, the princely vassals of the French crown were at some point even, even more powerful. Um, than, than the latter. At least if we consider the Normans and the Angevins that were also uh, kings of England, right? Otherwise, we're, however, still looking at comparable powers by scale, right? The, the Dukes of Burgundy, the, the, the Counts of Champagne, and more. Again, I made lots of videos about this, about the how the mo military mobilization worked, for example, uh, throughout the centuries. Uh, and uh, again, all things you can find in the medieval French warfare playlist. Um, then you had uh, other territories today belonging to to the, the French state, such as Alsace and Upper Lotharingia, that were that, that is Lorraine, that laid within also the Holy Roman Empire, right in the east. Um, in a way, these boundaries in in, in the with, with the Germanic Empire wouldn't change until the Sun King, right? In a you know consistent fashion at least. But it's important to stress also the proximities, the influences with, with other countries, the the differences within the same French region, like right? the ones of the, of the Kingdom of France proper, that reached as far as, for example, Catalonia. It was technically part of the Western Frankish Kingdom. The Duchy of Burgundy, as we were saying, based around Dijon, was part of uh, France. Uh, it was one of the most powerful states, um, actually ruled by, by the Capetian dynasty from quite early on, but very strong um, autonomistic prerogative, so that technically until the end of the Middle Ages, the, the Dukes of Burgundy managed not to have the French crown taken over. Um, and you know how it ended also in a sort of random way, right, with, with the death of Charles the Bold. But, in fact, that ex uh, exceeds far our chronological limits today. Uh, do not confuse the Duchy of Burgundy with the County of Burgundy that was located instead around Vesanson, and, of course, was part, say, continuing this Burgundian territory historically, but it laid within the Holy Roman Empire. Then in the south, you had... Um, basically almost all the territory east of the river Saône and Rhône, in fact forming part of the Holy Roman Empire as well, within the Kingdom of Burgundy. Uh, and you had some districts remaining imperial on the west banks of these rivers, for example Lyon, that was from, from the French side but wouldn't be annexated by, uh, by the, the French crown until pretty late in the Middle Ages, still, in fact, imperial. Um, and little, as we were saying, change along these northeastern frontiers. Uh, the French monarchic gradual push towards the Rhine began um, 
relatively timidly uh, from the mid 14th century, but still in a time in which they they would have to to back down because there was the Hundred Years' War uh, going on. And in practice, it was useful to have this buffer states in the in the east also because the western part of the Holy Roman Empire was particularly fragmented, right? It basically it's not even in fact from where the German kings were trying to centralize, even though they were very rich areas. So this would become later on in the modern era the target of French expansionism. But uh, at this point, they were just okay for the French to say, okay, well, no major threat will come from, say, major princely states located there. We will keep making videos about this region because uh, its history is pretty complicated, but more interesting, I would add, just for this. Um, so, northern France was, as we were saying, not even just completely homogeneous culturally and militarily, uh, during the period we cover today. As we are pointing out, Brittany was, for example, still largely Celtic in language, in identity. It preserved its own characteristic list, military customs well into the late 12th century, which is chronologically a major watershed in as much as what we define, strictly speaking, as a chivalry knighthood in the West occurs in the third from the third quarter of the 12th century with the lock of the nobility, in, in other words, the, the oligarchization of the same aristocracy. Um, and together with that, basically, whoever is cut off from this uh, sinks. Uh, and these countries as a well whole start getting ruled in a similar way with essentially the ultra elite, also from a military point of view, looking ever more alike. You can argue that by the 14th century, basically the whole Western Europe fought with the same identical arms and armor, aside from, yes, some shade um, indifference that we try to, to highlight here and there, especially with the historical military unit uh, videos, in part also these ones as some examples will be shortly uh, illustrated to exemplify. Um, in any case, um, Brittany had had um, an interesting ethnic uh, background to sort of characterize still this hit-and-run tactics we'll see a bit more later, as opposed to the heavier feudal style like French uh, power. Uh, in the 11th century, the same Normandy settled by, in fact, the, the Norse back in the 10th century on the lower Seine uh, basin still differed a bit from the rest of the country. There were more archaisms. There was perhaps a greater bias in infantry just because of Scandinavian influence. Albeit, by now, as it's, it is traumatically and violently exemplified by not just the, the Bayeux tapestry from an iconographical point of view, but in the actual conquest of England. Of course, the, the, Roman, the Normans had now become essentially Western Franks with that dramatically advanced, in fact, um, Western feudalism that they displayed with great effect uh, throughout all Europe and the Mediterranean. Practically have to have more videos on Schwerpunkt about the Normans, but if you are interested in the Duchy of Normandy and Norm Norman history at large, just know that I made some videos about this uh, as well. Um, uh, apparently, the Normans, just to explain a bit the connection, that uh, you know were not uh, naturally born. Cavalrymen, the Vikings did use much more um, horses in, in warfare than we realize, but they were not that sophisticated uh, yet. By the time they they settled um, in in the in the lower sand basin, seemingly learned how to ride in that sort of unprejudiced fashion by the Bretons, right? Not just by the Western Franks. So they had this interesting. Um, you know, connection that at some point even the Anglo Saxons had to to have with the with the Celtic fringe, right? For example, Harold Godwinson would fight as a 
you know, traditional Anglo-Saxon, mostly on foot in, in England. As a Norman on horseback with uh, this shock cavalry charges in Normandy, but also as a, you know, with more flexible cavalry tactics against the Welsh in, on the western frontier. So the Normans were very close, as you know, to, to England from, from quite a while. The broader Danish, um, Anglo-Danish connection, let's say. Um, and so lots of influences were already historically present with, with the Franks uh, across the Channel uh, and beyond. Right. The Flemish, too, that, as you know, together with the Bretons, in fact, participated consistently to the Norman invasion of England, distinguished themselves from the Western Franks. They spoke Dutch. Uh, they weren't technically Frenchmen, at least if we understand that as, in fact, the, the, the wider Romance uh, majority of the Western Frankish kingdom. Um, the Flemish notoriously developed their infantries starting from the from these very centuries, the eleventh, the twelfth, um, and twelfth, also the later Middle Ages, as you know, after the Italians, they were the more uh, effective uh, infantry uh, or on the market. Think about the Barbanson, as they were called, as this essentially mercenaries slash brigands. Um, that quite dangerously mingled with um, the heresies in the, the peak of that fin- religious phenomenon in, in, in the 12th century and ravaged uh, great parts of Europe, including uh, France, uh, there would be much more to be said about uh, Flemish infantry. I will make multiple videos on this. i got gotten thoroughly interested in them, um, and especially their pre courtray uh, Kortreg um, accomplishments, like the preparation to that, are somehow overlooked. Today we will not focus specifically on that, but notoriously, from especially the during the 13th century, the counts of Flanders lose feudally great part of their power, and the major Flemish towns in, of of the southwest, uh, namely Gand, Bruges, and Ypres, that is. Uh, Ghent, Brugge, and Dieppe uh, coalesce with these town infantry forces, together still with the, the local nobility, um, and they play a very important role in the development of, of European infantry. We, will sh- we should also say, actually, that the same Western Frankish infantry somehow overlooked. It is true, of course, it was not developed as, say, the Italian or Flemish one, but um, the fact that the country here was essentially run by the single most powerful oligarchic um, imperial and I say that because of the essentially uh, imperial character of the French monarchy and traditionalist um, aristocracy would largely obscure uh, or overshadow at at least the infantry development. Right. Uh, what is crucial here is to understand is that, that the Western Frankish, later French nobility, of course, considered themselves the true holders of the empire, the racially superior uh, breed destined to, to rule over the world. They, they were of sacred blood even more so by the, the incredibly prolific um, uh, Capetian dynasty and their branches that took control basically of everything um, in the in the country in the longer run, um, and of course whoever fought on foot was just a subhuman piece of trash just by metaphysical essence. And so this is true for most of Europe at this point. Nobody really cared about them but if of course we scratch a bit beneath the surface we do realize that the western frankish uh, communes were were importantly developed telling the truth the same monarchy at some point boosted them to for example within the same ile de france because there were very powerful bishops that had helped the, the monarchy to to rise but now we're becoming so sort, of sort of a more encumbered um that's why for example the french bishops are slightly less warlike over time than say the the, the German or the Italian ones, uh, because in, in the latter countries they were sort of more decentralized and acting a bit more like lords. Instead, northeastern France it was witnessing an important urban development, managed to say bring 
um, on the four these important uh, infantry uh, capacity from the local communes that were helped by the monarchy that of course was completely disgusted again by by villains and anyone but still quite pragmatically and intelligently uh, required their uh, their force to be displayed and this was ancestrally like in tradition in the romano-germanic um, uh, identity of course a matter of like if you, if you even if you were a commoner like and you displayed military power you, you were comparticipating to bro that broader imperium that god was essentially uh, making descend on you through the representatives uh, of his power on earth and the kings of france were even saints at some point they were the greatest crusaders the greater the holiest like the most catholic of um of the westerners so uh, there is a lot to say about the mystique of the french monarchy and it all lays in this when you understand here the the shocking you know cavalry capacity that france was able to, to export together with gothic architecture with music art generally speaking so an enormity an enormity to say the least um and uh say say neighboring countries like england being essentially a western frankish offspring to, to some to some extent um part of this is true for part of the reconquista the the same germans the same italians receive a lot of this influence to say the least um and uh, with the Crusades, when the French kings have their port in Egmont on the Mediterranean, everything flows outside as well. So it's really that powerful, right? Again, the, the, the massive, the, the, the extreme, the immense demographic and agricultural resources of France are what you see incarnated in this massive war horses right the 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 same gothic cathedral you can't feel the the the, the weight the the fatness the, of of the wealth of the system it's something astonishing and one thing you have to understand and especially picture concretely french uh, knighthood is that differently from other countries where wealth was sort of more evenly distributed because of say the, the lack in fact of a more centralized monarchy or all this um, violent amount of wealth was concentrated in an equally traumatic way just in a single, like in very, very, very few people constituting a very narrow proportion of the entire population that essentially was systematized since Gallo-Roman times to work exclusively to provide these kind of heroes. I mean, people that were conceived, like l literally born and bred and 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 raised and trained etc exclusively to slaughter enormous amount of people in the 30s like for one man say in in a in a crusade engagement um as the sole existential purpose uh of their life right and they're of course the, the divine transcendence in self-sacrifice in holy combat this is essentially what the french monarchy and the only possible existing french identity is exclusively based on like if you think that there is anything else uh that represents france other than this you ob you objectively you're not a westerner and you cannot afford to be one right and this of course is true for most people that live in, in the west as of course nobody in the rest of the world practically um but here we are if you don't understand or you're not willing this is the most important thing if you're not personally willing to accept this as a person you cannot afford to be a westerner the system was so big though that as we we're saying it was not homogeneous not just in a broader regional sense culturally or linguistically but not from a material point of view right you see of course here the the cradle of some of the mo single most advanced uh, western technologies but even regarding this you know i'm not a technologist and it is wrong to think that this let's say that the great power is just so because of technological advance i mean great civilization is also technologically advanced in many ways but it's not it's military that is in a qualitative sense to be more ahead than others right if you look at this period for example italy or spain they had some dramatic technological capacities uh, yet, what the French managed to achieve through their uh, 
monarchic development, and they're orientatively, say, much more the single most oligarchic system in the West, is mostly this incredibly hierarchical discipline and, in fact, punching moral force that is, as we were just saying, incarnated by these knights, that were primarily concerned, and the contrast, I think, is very beautiful, for example, between northern and southern France, or better, France proper, the north, Francia, and Occitania in the south, um, in as much as the the stereotype, like the archetype of the, you see, incarnated in Louis, in the couple of Louis the Seventh and Eleanor of Aquitaine. That this could be said for Henry the Second, to in, in that Western Frankish um, or, origin in a broader sense. But the idea again of, of the Northern French as incredibly brutal, rigid, cold, um, in, 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 embodying this apathy in the original um, philosophical sense, capable in fact of making them shed blood in large amounts without blinking an eye, and a sort of more feminine, telluric, sensual, um, passionate, um, emotional South, right? And there is some truth to that. Um, it is not quite as it seems. As also, Southern France actually is a pretty oligarchic and, you know, feudal and brutal and sort of cold reality to, 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 to much extent. This is true for actually most of of Western Europe d during this period, but indeed there is something in northern France that revolves around most of this um, spiritual training, right? This higher purpose that stemmed also for a much cruder background that sort of went by bypassed to some extent even just the the strict material wealth of these of this great feudal feudal houses, right? Um, you see. In fact, that rather than tactical innovation per se, what this system was was just pretty punching and strong. It's just like in Carolingian times, like the the Franks were surely a, a rougher, primitive people, more more primitive people than the Byzantines, than the Arabs, but at the same time they had a load, right? That is what Anna Komnena would, would write actually in uh, our same um, timeline about these. Franks being this Celts, as she said, because of course, you know, everything that was written in Roman times in a Byzantine mind was to be classically absolute. So if back in the day Gaul was inhabited by Celts, so these guys would have been. Um, naturally, something had changed in the meanwhile. It's not even a, a Roman thing, it's more like a Greek thing, in fact. Um, and this was recognized by the pseudo Maurice in the strategic and etc. that these guys were, yes, they were ruthless, they were violent, they were. In a sense, indisciplined, meaning that at least compared to the sclerotic uh, Byzantine authoritarianism, right, imperial authoritarianism, these French barons saw each other like as peers, right, and even the king was sort of a, a primus inter pares, in fact. And so they were unsophisticated and brutes and, and, and all these things, but, right, this is something that the Muslims pointed out as well. Um, during the Crusades, when these guys mounted on horseback, right, you, you couldn't stop them. These were by far the single most uh, incredible knights, right, that you could say that their courage was fanatic to the extreme, right, the, the moral load that invested these was shocking and incredible for these peoples that also were not military backwards at, at that time, right. Um, so from the ninth to the saint, uh, the the eleventh century, we were talking about it just um, a few days ago in that video about the stirrup. But I also talk about Carolingian cavalry in the eighth century. You know there had been um, that process of further social stratification in Gaul in in, in northern in France in France uh, at this point that had, um, say, remolded further that Romano-Germanic background from which already, especially Gaul, had remained very oligarchic. Remember that when we talk the Franks in, in French history, were in, in their clamor of political success, and they made a lot of videos about, in fact, however, not them, but rather their kings, 
Clovis, the Merovingian dynasty, and the other dynasties that succeeded, namely the Carolingians and the Carpathians, um, what was a, a system succeeding in that because of an elite alliance between the Gallo-Roman senators slash bishops and the Germanic nobility that really married into each other, but more importantly, as far as Gaul was concerned, had not essentially changed the previous imperial military system. I mean, Gaul was ravaged at some point by the barbarian invasions, but it had not been destroyed, right? This was true also for Spain to some extent, that in fact was turning a bit feudal before uh, the Arabs took over. This had not quite been the case for the Anglo-Saxons nor the Longbirds. Um, so France basically found this enormously structured and well you know, built system that had already also hosted, for example, the, the legions of the Rhine frontier, the greatest military concentration of the empire, etc. And this new Gallo-Roman Germanic aristocracy fundamentally took over the entire system and began immediately to mold it further on this on the confirmation, right, on the metaphysical confirmation of the spiritual superiority, spiritual and physical superiority of this elite, right, and the Carolingians, especially when they put together back uh, back together the what had been essentially fragmented into four different kingdoms during the Merovingian times, they reenhanced the system further. In the 10th century, especially, you have the collapse of the Carolingians, but at that point, uh, um, an aristocratic system so militarily ingrained, even at the local level, that this military class of militas emerges potently from the system. It basically puts uh, the, the, the system back together after a second invasion. And it's from this glue that we were talking about before, that this massive... Uh, cavalry um, evolved, right? Most of the people, again, was, if not demilitarized, however, incredibly subjected to this elite, right? Something that goes on until the French Revolution, basically. And with, with ups and downs regarding, say, the possibility of breaking free, think about the Jacquerie, but de facto, right? In, especially in France, this was not um, quite the case, right? Um, the poorer vassals, uh, in other words, began to uh, to fall out of uh, the, the military service as such, at least for what it had been the case for a vassal to be in Carolingian times, which is not necessarily a horseman, right? But in fact, this is the point. Those who either ser served either as infantry or unarmored cavalry did not disappear, but fundamentally became dramatically subordinated to this ultra-elite. Fighting as heavy cavalry, right, as professionals of war, right, people who spent literally their entire life on horseback, right, and that knew to do exclusively that. This is true already from the Merovingian and the Carolingian elite, Right, these people, they didn't do any. I mean, the, the Franks objectively did do nothing else but war. Right, they didn't have a public culture, they didn't have a literacy or a sophisticated administration. Overall, they did have, of course, this massive clientele that they politically managed to keep together, but only as much as they could foster them by rewarding them their retinues through warfare. And that's how the Carolingian Empire was was born in the first place to that massive extent. Right. Now the power was in the hands of these other militas that the Capetians found the ungrateful task now having to put back together under a sole monarchic power, which clamorously explodes in the 13th century, especially after the Battle of Bouvines, uh, and the clearance basically of the, the, of the Angevin dominance on most of, of the country that at that point does uh, get taken over by by the this empire this imperial dynasty let's be honest especially at that point that also the holy roman empire had basically the german monarchy had um collapsed and the french take over dramatically uh, on the international scene um this um further aristocratization accelerated further during the aforementioned third 
court of the 12th century for reasons that can't simply digress on but have a lot to do with the state building of the feudal monarchy but again if you check the medieval French playlist out you will find everything you, you need right um, there are interesting influences as we've seen from other um, ethnic backgrounds for example a, a region like uh, Flanders was at the beginning of the period not that developed yet historically had not been in general but through the work of the Counts of Flanders slowly gradually wins over for example the you know land uh, to, to, to the sea it manages to expand demographically it really consolidates its own um, its own aristocracy and in still displaying some interesting ethnic features with some Scandinavian relic for example given that the, the country had been battered heavily by the north back in the day and perhaps one of the greatest tragedies in the history of mankind uh, was the loss of the tomb of um, at least what we think was probably the, the tomb of Count William of Flanders from coming from the church of Saint Bertin Saint Omer in, in Flanders um, this went destroyed uh, together with some other effigies of the London Temple Church um, and uh, this was an incredible we have of course some drawings um, but it was uh, really cool as it portrayed a warrior with a tall round and sort of and rather Germanic helmet having a fixed face mask a bit like um, the ones of you know we start seeing from from the from Vandal era for example and as type of helmet and we are in the around the the, the mid 12th century something between 1130 1175 right um, this face mask did not protect however all the face um, it consisted uh, th this helmets were evolving also just as you know towards the 13th century with a full coverage of, of the face compared to the, the open helmets say that could, you would have normally um, by 11 say like look at the bio tapestry all right uh, this particular face mask consisted of a nasal with cheek pieces on either side to frame the eyes right but just for saying how much there is also from we'll see it now better from from earlier times in this western frankish namely arms uh, and armor right the french monarchy developed intensely in the centuries from this fundamentally feudal princely background Right, the Capetians were advantaged by some resources of the Ile de France, some that say just the, the location, how it was politically and internationally uh, sided. And, um, and yet it emerged a bit like all these other princely powers that at some point did form a state within the, the broader state. We've seen the, the, the Duchy of Burgundy, for example, but still in the later Middle Ages, we recently talked about the Bourbon, Right, um, all Capetians, right, but still as territorial polities capable of sustaining an army of, of, of their own uh, at the provincial level, uh, just to, to render the idea, right. Um, surely, uh, the this this provincial dimension was sort of in fact the the real winner of 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 the of the game because it was about competition and thus internal cohesion due to metus hostilis and essentially the biggest power uh, the, the the greatest at least the one who made it out, out of uh, all other not just because it had the crown but because in fact was able to to preserve it also at a at a national level managed eventually in fact to take over the entire country then there is a sort of bouncing phenomenon at the end of this period that we have documented a bit in, in the crisis of the French armies uh, by the time of the Hundred Years War that was not really due to a lack of quality of the, the, the individuals but mostly because of this um, Leviathanic expansion that the, the monarchy had had during the previous century and the 
lack by those time standards of, of the means to actually create uh, a state that could functionally keep this enormous Atlantic Plains resources all together and so causing some internal imbalance where some sort of more concentrated, motivated and you know tidier system like the, the one cultivated uh, from Edward the uh, first to Edward the third really was brought to perfection. We'll talk of course more about English warfare for that matter. Right. In the end, however, the French system won. And we were talking just recently about the uh Bande d'Ordonnance um and how you know the essentially the the basis for a, a, a modern army was being laid to some relevant scale in this now region, fully regionally stasalized bow. Um, so you can see before the Capetian triumph these provincial differences, right? You had, for example, the richer and more powerful counts uh, and dukes making less use of the general levy of a rear band of old men owing military um, service which, in fact, had been abandoned the more the feudal system had been specializing the, the military elite, that at this point, in its um, vassalatic beneficiary mechanisms, also was being surpassed by, instead, some properly f fully paid and regularly paid uh, soldiery, in fact, almost mercenaries, like the same vassals, wouldn't serve the king for more than uh, some week, right, on, on a regular basis, then they would normally spend much more for their private wars, but there was so much that could be asked without an actual pay, and sometimes even in, with this particular limits with that, right? But there is no doubt that France was pretty advanced in this process, and um, very large armies, including the regional levies, were sometimes seen in the 12th century as well. There were some areas, especially in, in, in the south of, of the country, that still had a sort of more evenly um, uh, distributed wealth of some sort and were thus more relying on the, the local levies. But this is not really a, a symptom of particular power. This is in fact how the North manages to, to take over the South without too much problem because the South was sort of much more fragmented uh, exactly because their elites were weaker and controlled smaller territories. It was a, a, a huge puzzle of seigneuries that had not even had the possibility to attempt some sort of princely statalization within their provincial dimension as instead it had been happening in, in Northern France. Because the system, par it's a paradox, right? The system was so intensely privatized and decentralized that exactly from there, like in this, again, enormous amount of resources, because otherwise there are other parts of Europe that are intensely privatized, decentralized, and remain extremely backwards and weak. Um, and this is true the more north and east you go. Uh, but in this case, had so many resources that began to s build their own little states from within themselves and they were as such much more compact hand I'd say a handful of major principalities in the north that managed to be co-opted and you know channeled by the by the monarchy for example towards the south think about the Albigensian crusade the Capetians were so rich and so powerful at that point they could simply hire mercenaries to fight against the English in Normandy and sending all their uh, unruly vassals towards the south to, to slaughter the heretics and basically any other uh, person will oppose them for that matter God will indeed recognize their own um, so in this picture as you understand and we pointed out before towns were not very important from a military point of view again France does have a communal phenomenon I also made a video about for example the relation between Louis the sixth and um, the the commune of Soissons but these are sort of exceptions, right? France does not develop strong communal forces like uh, like Italy, for example. And in general, it does have, however, these big towns, but not 
full cities that are just often big markets run by the, the, the local princes. They can't put together decent militias. They are numerous. They're well kept, right? And we will see better later also how French infantry warfare fares uh, at this point. Right. In, in any case, the guys who were really in charge of, of the defense were the local lords, right, lay or ecclesiastical alike. Right. They would use the local troops, but mostly it's the feudal retinues that make the job done, and this was true from a very long time, especially in Gaul. There had been also um, efforts by all these institutions to regulate violence um, because of the originary... Uh, fragmentation of, of of local politics, the Peace of God movement, for example, in its uh, local variations, um, were as common in northern France as in in the south. Right, initially they began with the concept of Peace of God, for which um, they would have not had to uh, to attack, especially the ecclesiastical, like the churches, any kind of um, a church possession etc then there would be the so-called truces of god that were more designed for the laymen telling them things like i don't know don't fight each other on sunday or you know if you really have to go to the crusades instead you know just leave the country entirely of course the the bishops uh, were less militarized than the lay aristocracy so they tended just through their prerogatives and immunities to try to to calm things down, but still in, in the early period here, of course, the, the French bishops were pretty um, pretty warlike, right? I, I also illustrated that for the Battle of Bouvines. This was really common in Europe by this time. It would remain in some countries specifically for, for a longer one, right? Um, the uh, limiting extent of warfare was in of itself also a way to favor the oligarchic monopoly on the use of violence, but also in the development of a professional military, right? Uh, this was a way of, okay, like, let's orient the community towards, again, the support f towards the establishment. And this was actually a very virtuous system overall. I mean, this was, as a pre-industrial society, a pretty unstable system in many ways, but... Indeed, the, there is in France, historically, a precocious consensus of um, respect towards authority, um, it, uh, very often in a much more functional way than the hierarchical system in itself wouldn't immediately suggest, right? The fact that a society is hierarchical doesn't mean that it is just per se oppressive, right? There are states that are very hierarchical and they're sclerotic and weak and they crumble, uh, because it's, they're just, you know, oppressing their own people. France was different, right? There was still at this point, in spite of social certification, the the understanding that, yes, the system may have been unfair, may have presented with abuses, these noblemen were not particularly uh, tender-hearted people, to, to say the least, uh, also because they were trained, as we've seen, exclusively to, to, to massacre people, <laughs> the full large, but not, of course necessarily their people, not necessarily. Um, in any case, of course, as for every single government, there is no such thing like a country being run without the size of moral majority of the people. This moral majority may be minimal, so you have very big, weak systems that are very totalitarian, like dictatorships, etc., that are asphyctic in their nature. France here instead is, again, incredibly punching, just per se, and does develop, after all, in, in its own internal balance, a very coherent and functional system that is evidently winning in, in, in the period in Europe and, um, and abroad. So, by the end of the 11th century, full military equipment, especially when you look at uh, cavalry, had become predictably very expensive. I shall make multiple videos on the cost of a knight. Right. This is not just the people just think about armor, arms because they are you know determinist humanists or of some sort. But uh, first of all, maintaining a whole a war horse alive, just like having a Ferrari or a private jet or yacht, it, it's literally like the equivalent of that. 
Um, of course, the Ferrari costs a bit less than a private jet of yacht, but it's literally depending on which scale you're talking of, of this aristocracy that, that is segmented within itself. Um, just, just to give you a picture of the disparity. Um, but it's also like continuing to feed this animal and night to train constantly for the rest of their existence, at least especially the nightly one, um, just to be that war machine. It's not just about this. It's not just about the peasants that have to maintain this guy from a purely military point of view. It's, it's about this broader state. It's about the Gothic cathedrals, without which you cannot indoctrinate a knight to be a perfect crusader. So you need a clergy that has to be maintained as well, that has to study, that has to develop theological studies, like the one of Paris, for example, is, cent is the central one in Europe. Um, and so all of this is reflected in the panoply of the Western Frankish knight. Right, um, it it was really an impressive set of arms and armor that demanded really considerable skills to handle. Right, men trained as units rather than individuals is the key. Collective training, right? Tactics demanded even more command and control as well as professionalism, and so the great, um, let's say, mold of 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 this military elite is in fact the same social hierarchy right uh, with such enormous disparity and divide the individual knight wouldn't be a guy that defended just i don't know a few kilometers radius around his castle these men were so powerful that could in fact take part in broader regional campaigns again we've seen it in the videos about the western frankish mobilization system and so gaining experience was not just about fighting as an individual, of course, but in, not even in this collective, um, for say, tactics that now we will, we will observe better, but literally knowing how to organize this all, how to move hundreds of men across original space, fighting, sustaining themselves, um, having this broader political international relations um, during the campaign itself, and knowing how to redistribute the wealth, the loot, the ransom locally to structure those princely states that we were talking about before, right? Um, so I have here a list of examples. There are really many because France does provide with a huge amount of iconographic evidence. Um, so I had to select them at least not to be too repetitive. But this is going to be repetitive. This is not much about like external influences, but exactly how a Western Frankish horseman really was, and with just with some oddity that we can't point out later, or that is interspersed in these models that are all different because uh, the panoplies were not standardized uh, industrially, and so each one was a sort of little work of art in its own, right? Some are arms and armor from actual archaeological finds, some are iconographic sources, um, etc. Then we will talk a bit more about tactics as well, but let's delineate a Western Frankish milice at this point. Uh, and its weapons, for example, we have a spearhead from northern France dating to the 11th to 12th century, preserved at the National Museum of Antiquities of saint germain en laye um, that is sort of unique because um, at this point uh, you don't have this design in parallel with the development of the Couchet Lanx um, grip uh, type that goes in parallel with this thickly packed shock charge cavalry uh, formations. Right, you have a thick, substantial um, uh, design. It is also broad blade, including flanges slash wings, right? And with the development of the Couchet Lanx fighting style, the, the sense was that having these flanges was not particularly practical because the best thing you could hope was to transpass the enemy and not maintaining your Lanx stack of also just facilitating penetration in the first place because cavalry impact is basically what eventually this whole thing gets functionalized towards. Surely by the 11th to 12th century, it was a big deal of still fencing um, and not just of, of, of trusting, right? But at this point, it's still 
it's already fairly rare to see this uh, this flanges because they are sort of an anti-penetration device right as it even uh, historically they they had developed just to also in you know in during for as hunting weapons but not only just with human beings when you you know pierce someone first of all like vital organs are a few centimeters uh, in right so you do not need to pass a person from from side to side but more especially you you want to avoid the legs to get stuck into the person that takes a long time to die actually and can even you know climb the the spear transpassing uh, them and killing you in the process so you, you want to stop this and so um, the idea is that more or less this type of weapon is not just an anti-penetration device but also um, say expressing a bit more fencing capacity in a context that as the the single most shocking cavalry charges tactics were concerned were, was not so important after all yes there were single duels and horseback and whatever but again overall it had been fading and yet we still find this then we have the seal of the city of Soissons um, dating to the early mid 12th century preserved at the National Archives of Paris depicting a knight right uh, that symbolized the city itself so this is fascinating because it still shows how a communal dimension still so in of course the knight uh, is a relevant um, identity right of course no commune would ever be ruled purely by people flying on foot this was just never the case anywhere but the fact that this became the, the city symbol itself in is quite meaningful especially in, in a place like the county of Soissons. Um, this guy is the typically northern French knight of the period from his arm and armor uh, arms and armor that include um, conical helmet, long-sleeved male hauberk, a tall shield on a guiche, a shield boss, in a broad tapering straight key on sword. Right, the tapering sword suggests, and this is the place where you know it's happening the most in Europe, more uh, anti-armor capacity, like having to stick into the the armor joints uh, rather than just you know um, cutting per se. Um, that's a very powerful indicator of this feudal warfare. It tells you how much armor there is around. The guy also um, has um, uh, a slit in the left hip of the hauberk, and given that there is no sword belt uh, belt visible, it's likely that the weapon was thrust through the slit um, instead of the scabbard being just um, underneath. We have a sword from the third uh, quarter of the 12th century preserved at the Royer private collection of Paris. This is also a typical North, uh, northern French uh, weapon but the mid 12th century it's also present in the surrounding countries as a as a Western European uh, one. Uh, the blade tapers almost to a point, but the latter lacks specifically meaning that rather than trusting, um, there was still a you know um, an emphasis around this time on chopping just more likely armored opponents. This is a very interesting topic actually because we may think, I don't know, weapons like falchions, etc., to be in the hands mostly of peasants. It was not the case, right? If you could, the peasants would preferably opt for pole arms, or something that would keep the, the enemy at, at the distance because they were lightly armored. But it was exactly a heavily armored knight that could get into the midst, in fact, of these commoners and chopping them to pieces just with this cutting, cut, chop, chop um, type of weapons, right? Uh, this ward also has likely Kurt Kion and uh, an almond shaped pommel. We have from the church of uh, Saint en Amiennois some card reliefs depicting the martyrdom of the saints Fusien, Victoric, and Jean Thiel. Um, this uh, work dates to the late 12th, the early 13th century, which in parallel with the nobiliar uh, 
barrage, right? And so the old further oligarchization of um, the French army uh, produces the adoption of a remarkably uniform style of arms, armor in military costume. Um, this is true pretty much all across the region, but also like what has become Frankish Europe as, as a whole um, in, in the West. Um, we see a long-sleeved male Holberg uh, in one of, of, of these figures with integral mittens and a male coif plus male shoes on, on the legs uh, all worn beneath a simple sleeveless surcoat. Very, very typical. If you're interested, by the way, in the development of the Western knightly uh, arms and armor, I made a video about that, and we focus on single, on single pieces of art and sort of making, right, rendering back also properly the image, the figure of that guy, and in, in looking diachronically how Western arms and armor evolved again from this time, time onwards, especially in the post Carolingian kingdoms. Basically, even the apparently minimal um, arms and armor technological innovations go in parallel. Basically, uh, around the, the same years, you find a type of um, uh, arms and armor characteristic just used pretty much everywhere. So this tells you also how international these elites were and how updated, militarily speaking, they strive uh, to to be. Now the British Library in the manuscript Cotton Narrow, C4356, um, in, uh, in London, we have um, uh, the, the depiction of the Massacre of the Innocents. This manuscript is known as the Winchester Psalter, it's very famous, and we do not know whether it's Northern French or Southern English, in any case, this is, it's dated from the beginning of, of the 12th to, say, the 60s of the, of the uh, same century. Um, let's say Northern France and Southern England in many ways go in tandem in terms of military development, but also, I don't know, in the development of Gothic art and principles, for example. So it's very difficult sometimes to distinguish what's, again, French or English at this point. They're very, very similar. Uh, without mentioning, as we've seen in the various videos about medieval England, that's still the, the elite of the, um, of the Angevin monarchy essentially prefers to live in France in their ancestral possessions rather than um, among the Anglo-Saxons, right? So they are literally the same people. Um, and we see many figures in the Winchester Psalter uh, well armed and armored. Um, there is some unusual characteristic here and there. For example, a guy uh, wears an interestingly um, forward angled uh, type of conical helmet in which the nozzle mm, curves down from the lower rim of the helmet. His sword is hung on his right hip, um, which was usually uh, on the other side. Uh, but it can be just an artistic license of sort. The Holberg is slit at the side instead of fore aft. This was more characteristic of the um, of 11th century, and especially infantry um, equipment, which could actually point at the fact that I discussed in the equivalent video to this one for for for. England, that in in the latter um, region, in fact, there may have been a greater permanence of infantry. Just I'm this has actually nothing to do with the later, for example, hundred years war tactics, etc. But the idea is that aside from the Saxon South, it was sort of rich, advanced, supported feudal, Norman feudalism, etc. Uh, already, if you went through through the Midlands, you you saw many more archaisms, a, a less affluent feudality, and so, generally speaking, a permanence even of some the uh, Anglo Norse sense of foot trooper, like more in the Viking era, right? Because they were not 
affluent enough to to have a horse and or this, those areas were wilder and so cavalry was um, sort of less used and at least there was more need to dismount to fight on foot this is true in many ways also I don't know the it's not until the, the mid 12th century for example that the Germans adopt fully um, Western Frankish feudalism and so you see often entire mounted armies dismounting in fact I mean entire mounted um, formations dismounting um, because they fought, I don't know, behind a stream or whatever, so this could be an indicator, this was more an English than a French uh, type of armor, but it's just splitting hair, it doesn't actually lead uh, very far, but just bear in mind that of course knights were trained to fight excellently on foot as well, and some would even prefer that maybe to some extent. We have at the Chartres Cathedral in the county of Blois, um, a representation of the murder of St. Thomas Becket. Uh, we are around the first decade of the 13th century. Um, you can here see a more advanced type of armor that is kicking in. You have now mittens included in the uh, in the male hauberk, um, then the coif instead being separated albeit uh, in this case it's not really um, to be seen. Male shows uh, are worn, of course, for like protection. Uh, the shields have become shorter and broader. Um, this is um, fascinating because, of course, it sort of tended to encompass more the see in the front of a soldier because the shield was now the, because of the shows shorter. Right, um, and of course, the the ar armor as such was more protective than the shield itself. So we'll see now this trend. You know, that towards the 13th century, you have the shield becoming smaller, triangular in form. You have the the helmet closing on the face because the couche lengths, uh, thickly packed charge shock uh, tactics were just impacting your face more more often and not very narrow eyeslits. So that's the typical Western knight um, of the time. In fact, the helmet is what really stands out. You see how they're now uh, now from this um, iconography flat top. Um, they may have there were still different solutions. Everybody like had different means to 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 reach that to the full uh, to the fullest. Uh, for example, there there could be two um, uh, fixed face mask visors, right? Um, one without even one of them. Um, non protected sides or back of the head so these are not full helmets like the great one that will eventually become sort of standard um, and they they are transitioning and so they they illustrate meaningfully how you get to the great helm you see no visor on a flat top helmet um, meaning that some early face masks may have been removable Yet again, from the Chartres Cathedral, we have a stained glass window representing the legion of Roland and Oliver, depicting uh, many uh, moors as well. Uh, at the end of this video, I will talk about all different um, Moorish figures from French art of the time, because there is a lot of crusade stuff going on by the French nobility that, as you know, was essentially the the prevalent one in, in Levant, in the Ultramar states, um, and um, and so it's interesting to see how in France they would render what they thought was like Saracen armor, but also likely getting this from other places, right? For example, you know, lamellar was to be found still pretty late in time, or just scale armor, for example, in Germany, in Italy. So there were. Mm, some contacts with, with other Christian countries that were a bit more exotic in some types of arms and armor from Hungary for example and so there is uh, the Angevins actually uh, rule in, in, in Hungary itself at some point so uh, later on so France also is able to imitate a lot um, if anything from an iconographic point of view but you have to imagine also in the actual military uh, 
uh, techniques. So we see flat topped helmets for the Christians in the scene with round edges. This may simply indicate a different construction technique uh, variation. We see all of the aforementioned helmets shown with facial visors. Some reach below the chin, others are uh, shorter. We see one visored helmet almost conical in shape, uh, but um, we do not know whether it's meant to be of the same type that the, the Moors wear, that is the, the simple conical helmet here, stereotype. Uh, only once a uh, Moor is defeated with a helmet with a forward angled crown, for example. The Christians uh, wear here long sleeved male hauberks with mittens, male coif, and shoes. Most of them, but not all of them, wear surcoats and carry the newer type of broader flat topped kite shaped shield. Because again, the shield was becoming more like a deflective um, uh, auxil fencing auxilium rather than a, you know. Um, all encompassing sort of um, entire shape enclosing shield because as we will explain better now just knights were ever more fighting ever more in, in formation and so the exploit was single guy needing a concave uh, shape just to be out there on his own or to be more protected on the flanks Indi as an individual right was rare Right, and in any case, armor was now heavier, so generally speaking, the shield was uh, just an endurance, or at least you, 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 that could be useful, but armor would do most of that anatomically and ergonomically, so um, it, it did um, tire you, but still, it was the, the most functional way, and you needed your arms to act more freely uh, than before. Uh, spears are now more relevant in this art you see essentially the again the shock function as opposed to the single combat one in which the sword was more important of course the sword was always there but it, the lance is shown more prominently than before the sword was more important than lance even as well of course as always but um we will see how, because of again of the collective function of these um, knights on the battlefield, the the main goal was just to crush the enemy with this cavalry charge and not even wasting time into hand-to-hand -hand combat, just you know pursing down at that point with the sword and chopping them to pieces. But um, even with not an, an, a much bigger uh, sword than than before, that was needed instead to properly smash into uh, into uh, well-armored opponents just into uh, single combat because normally that's how you went more than um, in a collective um, uh, formation situa combat situation right this is these are just t tendencies but they are uh, supported by this iconographic evidence we see broad swords indeed with straight or even curved quillon hung from knotted sword belts. Um, the moors are less realistically depicted. This is kind of obvious because there was some convention about them. We see male or scale holbergs and quaff uh, shown for them, but also male shows lamellar cuirasses worn over the male. The shields are typically round. This was I made a video about the medieval shield, and you know how the, there were some, again, artistic conventions that uh, were sometimes accurate after all. Because yes, the the Muslims normally had this smaller shields than the Christians, but of course, in these depictions you have more stylistic um, categorization, right? So the proportions is not, it's not exactly the one that you would have really seen on a crusade battlefield and we'll keep talking about this in, in some other videos you know 
at this point you have so many videos that I always stop saying ah, you know, there is this video in which I talk about that yes, there is <laughs> there is an entire crusade playlist but I don't have to remind you all the time or which type of video um, which one specifically because some are dedicated exactly to this but it's extenuating sometimes to stop um, at all times the Chart Cathedral Poire Claire story stained um, glass window um, dating to 1255 depicts um, the participants in the crusade of Louis the Nine. Right? This talks about the ill-fated Seventh Crusade. Um, the various coats of arms can be identified. Um, sometimes it's, it's not really uh, clear who these guys individually are. There are the. We will talk more about the various French houses. Um, we started with the Bourbon recently, but for example, here you find one, the House of Dreux, the one of Beaumont. Um, there are the royal arms of France as well, of course, because of the heavy Capetian participation in these crusades and combat, including, you know, with Louis IX that gets captured by the Saracens. We find. Uh, what was an evidently uh, an intentionally depicted old fashioned arms and armor uh, um, scent represented for St. George, right? That was intended to be a oh, look, this is the older guy that started the whole uh, chivalry thing, or at least, you know, ideally, uh, ancestrally and archetypically, and in, in, a, in a Christian way, we we celebrate the fact that he would fight even as we were saying at the beginning of the video with less armor and with more old-fashioned uh, in fact uh, arms than, than our own but he was better because he was St. George right uh, Louis the Nine cared particularly much about this kind of um, rhetoric um, we see otherwise and this is interesting as well the, the various French crusaders wearing a pretty uniform panoply. Um, for their helmets, uh, however, things change substantially. Now, these guys wear halberds with, uh, may, uh, say, male mittens and coiffetless, where we can properly spot them. Some surcoats have um, sharply um, angled and horizontal shoulders, which likely means that there was a substantial um, padded armor protecting the shoulders or even some sort of semi-rigid um, queer bouillie worn beneath the heraldic circles that would have been normal in general um, but um, over the male holbergs um, of course so some, some extra padding over and beneath the armor. It's actually not that strange. We've seen before how Lamellar could be worn over her armor. There was really nothing strange. The Byzantine cataphracts had even three layers of armor. Okay, those were the ultra heaviest super uh, cavalry type that cost too much even to, to be fielded at some point. But these guys are pretty heavy and yet pretty dynamic. All figures represented on the stained glass window have male shows. The shields are the typically um, in almost at this point triangular with rounded or square upper corners types. Only one of the mounds wears a caparison which um, is interesting because uh, it shows how there were different degrees of armor for horses that differed in I mean conceptually from at least the distribution that knights had. Knights were on average much better armored than their horses, right? But you start having towards this period heavier armor, even properly coat of mail covering the entire horse, but in that case it would have been ultra heavy and just cost prohibitive for most French knights. Um, all the men, um, save St. George, carry spears. Most of them have large pennons, which basically just uh, re express the, their heraldry. But it's, it's interesting that it varies to some degree. On the west front of the Amiens Cathedral, some carvings 
uh, dating to the 30s of the 13th century. Uh, displaying allegorical religious warrior figures, however, the equipment is standard. You see the usual male hauberks with mittens, male coif, male shoes. You see loose surcoats, um, padded shoulders that um, are also raised in this sense. Um, so the uh, the sur underneath the, the surcoat. Um, so you don't see it, but you see the elevation. Uh, anatomically, you realize there's some padding um, underneath. We see um, just all, one figure wearing a longer cloth garment beneath his surcoat. We see rounded or slightly conical helmets, lacking nozzles, which is a bit, you know... Um, archaic. In fact, stemming from either a segmented Spangenhelm uh, construction or essentially being reinforced with metal strips and, and a band around the, the brim. Um, this is not so strange after all. There, there were still some, especially from Northern Europe, some Spangenhelm designs to be found here and there anachronistic but still again not everybody had to be equally outland and doesn't hear um, the choice may be entirely you know may be connected with who knows which kind of symbolism overall of these guys looking more archaic or whatever the swords are really big they do taper but they're blunt ended they have either um, Let's say that they have three file squat round or triangular pommels. We also see a sword belt of the new buckled type wrapped around the sword scabbard. From the British Library manuscript uh, Harley 782 dating to the late 13th century. We do not know again whether this is French or English. Um, it, it's usually associated with England, but we are not really sure. Mostly the simple style would point at that. It's true that the English had sometimes more stylized sort of figures, but this doesn't doesn't really mean much. We see here some knights. The horsemen have later form of conical great helms, which protect um, uh, them against a horizontal thrust, but also have a this glancing surface functional against a downward blow. Again, Mel Oberg's shows a triangular shield which has evenly shrunk in size by the late 13th century because plate armor is really around so it's becoming ever less relevant. One guy wields a tapering sword with a distinct point and slightly decorated key on. Another rides a horse with a full male bard, which is interesting. It's a half-armored horse, um, which is not what you see too often, but of course um, a compromise of having the full um, armor barding was just having the frontal part so but it's not so frequent because at least medieval warfare has become about a lot of flank missile fire for reasons that we'll illustrate now when we're talking infantry warfare we have uh, in the National Library of France in Paris, the French manuscript 779, and at the folio 134 recto, um, we can see a knight taking part in the siege of Shizar in Syria with a great helm, apparently displaying a, an additional triple ventilation um, above the eye slits. Right, you have this holes just above, and it's interesting because it's repeated. In the rear panels as well. The great helm at this point we are this 
This is a history of Outremer, manuscript dating to the third quarter of the 13th century. Um, at that point, the Great Helm was really universal for the heaviest cavalry, and it was incredibly difficult to breathe in that. Right? Sometimes you find these videos that say, oh, well, but it wasn't actually that difficult to, to move or do stuff, fight in armor, uh, everything was er ergonomic, etc. Et well, yes, it was, and of course, it wasn't done to prevent knights doing what they had to do, but don't think even for a minute that it was actually easy to fight in these things at all, right? Um, knights usually um, put their helmets on just in the last, um, say, 100 meters before charging, right? So, because they they literally would suffocate at some point if they had to breathe more and more. I just, for example, I'm writing an article from uh, talking about the battle in the early 14th century, we do find the actual... Well, you could exhaust, you could really have a collapse internally just in, in the entire organism, just out of the stress of the situation, and literally die just of that. Um, find multiple instances of that. But, so you can imagine how important in the circumstances oxygen really was to uh, to ventilate your your organism, to oxygenate. And this is um, the, the reason why you had this holes, which technically uh, actually weakened the helmet structure, uh, and they surely caused some death as well, but uh, breathing satisfactorily was um, way more important at some point than somebody's life, right, in those circumstances. So you would get maybe like a lax in your brain, but uh, the chances of, of that were sort of um, more, they were acceptable in the, front, in, in the face of the extreme need for air uh, and uh, oxygenation of your muscles uh, during this enormous uh, combat effort for, with this full panoply on. It was actually enormous, to, to say the least, from an individual point of view. Nothing that an average person without multi-year training can do, right? So, yes, it was functional for them, but you would die into it. Also, you wouldn't, I mean, you would die because you wouldn't be able to perform that and somebody would kill you, and that, that's the actual point. But they were close to die just because of their own physical effort, which was insane, right? And for not talking about the moral one needed for that. We have another uh, manuscript of the history of Ultramer, but it's, of course, another, we don't know how many there were of those. Um, this is preserved at the Municipal Library of Epinal Manuscript 45. At Folio 22 Verso, we have, um, this, this comes from, work comes from Paris, right? This manuscript was made there in the last, um, luster of the 13th century. We see here that the knightly equipment me protecting Pauline, uh, presumably of Cuir Bouilly, but there were metal ones uh, as well. In fact, the latter were becoming increasingly common. Um, and we see it especially in the manuscript iconography in the end of the 13th century. Uh, and this Pauline would be fastened to thigh covering quizzes. Worn over, uh, worn over the male shows, so becoming ever more compact and sort of enveloping and trying to protect the entire pack, also trying to distribute the, for example, the, the blow energy all around um, the tail all over these pieces so that they wouldn't break, but especially your knee wouldn't break, which, um, of course, would have been a tragedy, but you can imagine all the... Fr have you ever thought about all the fractures, especially a, a medieval knight would regularly get in his lifetime. All the time he's smashing into something at high speed. I mean, this, this is an overlooked aspect of military history that I always thought um, to be particularly relevant and still never seen someone talking about all the crippled um, people that, especially among the knightly elite, uh, had to go on anyhow, right? Because you know, they, they had invested too much just to abandon the craft in the first place. But it would have been a sort of shame, right? Because they thought that they were as morally as physically superior, so if something happened to them, it was always their fault. 
after all. They hadn't been enough, either mentally or physically, both at the same time, of course. We have, um, from the former Oakshot Archaeology of Weapons, a depiction of uh, coming from the, the Apocalypse of St. John, normally dated to the last fort of the 13th century, probably being at least uh, to the latest um, end of it, around 1300. Arms and armor are fantastic here. Um, a fighter wields a veritable falchion of also disproportionate size. Um, his sword hand is protected by a gauntlet with a splinted wrist defense. He also wears a brimmed chapelle de fer, which is seemingly cast out of a single iron piece. Gauntlets would have not been normal until the, the early 14th century, so it's sort of a precursor, and especially if the manuscript is older than, than we think. At the National Library of Paris we have said depiction that uh, Violet Le Duc from a Roman de Tristan manuscript dating to the 60s of the 13th century. And what is fascinating here is the weapon, an early form of bill or birdish elongated axe of some sort, right? This surely evolved from the earlier war axe, and we tend to forget how these weapons actually developed exactly within northern France. Historically, eventually, they sort of, we, we, we think of the Danish axe, etc., but it's just like in Roman times with the Francisca. Actually, these were weapons created by the by respectively the Franks and, 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 the, and the Romans because they were more functional to anti-armor, um, mostly for fighting each other, right? And the only point is that the Franks in Carolingian times get ever more on horseback, so you can't quite wield a double-handed axe on horseback, and so you mostly have peoples like the Norse that have slightly less cavalry, uh, to say the least, and that prefer to fight on foot um, for that reason, and uh, that more typically have this, which literally serves the purpose of opening somebody's, you know, chest cage um, with a single blow, and, and even just destroying everything that is, that is within, making the enemy bleed out if there is a a chain mail and padded armor even in between. These weapons could open even mail armor in the, the heaviest of blows that are very difficult and to, 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 to deliver and to actu actually smashing the mail in the first place, which is really hard rose. But ideally, this is what were created for, like at least destroying the armor as much as they would destroy the same axe, because they went in parallel, telling you the truth. Um, and this weapon, however, displays also a trusting point in the drawing which associates it to what would have eventually become the halbart with the trusting fracturing and cutting function at the same time. Um, another feature of this weapon is the lower point curving back to rest um, to essentially even to be attached to the aft of, of the same axe. Uh, we find some similarities with for at least some examples of 14th century European and later Islamic war axes, but for that matter it's otherwise unt untypical. Just know that evidently they were there in some ways and that also in France, therefore at this point, it's not all just cavalry, of course, uh, among the heavies uh, as well. I have a, a pretty late um, evidence for our chronology dating to the 60s of the 14th century. The uh, drawing of the, in fact, f unfortunately lost a uh, tomb slab of Guillaume de Bruyne from the church of Saint Juan in Rouen, Normandy. Um, this is after 17th century drawing. Uh, that the Gazette de Beaux-Arts in the volume 84, published in 1974. Um, and it's interesting how, of course, at the time of the Grand Siècle, there was uh, an antiquarian interest towards, of course, a nobiliar um, panoply. Uh, 
Um, so we are in Normandy, and this knight um, seems to be particularly old-fashioned in armor. There are, however, novelties in his equipment. For example, a raised male neck guard, which was probably fastened to the padded gambeson, visible at his wrists um, as a you know broader vest. Uh, he has a decorated um, uh, kion, uh, a, you know, pretty straight sword. Um, his legs are armored with polane, narrow greaves with perhaps some um, added extension below the knee to reinforce the, the junction, and a flap of mail that basically uh, provides with a rough sabaton um, like protection on top of his foot. So as we were saying before, uh, this, uh, and as we've just illustrated with some relative exceptions in the knightly arms and armor, tactics were not fully homogeneous, at least um, knights would be able, as we said, to perform any kind of tactics, just the the collective one was the preferential one, was the one of the big armies, the one that settled the most important issues also politically and not just militarily. Um, we see in the, uh, the outskirts of this Western Frankish a powerhouse how for example the feigned retreat was sort of more out there because of some slightly lighter cavalry bias among the Normans and the Bretons and not even because they were lighter I mean the Normans by this point especially historically were you know again very much the same than the Western Franks but in the earlier period in general they could have been even just less in number for example and so training districts, which are, you know, the feigned flight is uh, always like a real flight at the same time. I mean, there is literally no difference. Even if it's pre-order or whatever, you still lose that um, cohesion, and it's just a choice that you w would never make unless you were to create an asymmetry that, however, for, for, to, for the enemy, that would have be to be carried out only in the case you would put yourself in an asymmetry which happens only when things are desperate for you and so it becomes more of a gamble than a certainty to operate like that if you're strong strategically you just go full in that's how it works right it's the most effective way of channeling forces as far as the Bretons were concerned however such hit and run tactics dated back in the region uh, at least since uh, late antiquity, and so always the sort of wilder Celtic fringe frontier that basically has to cope with the heavier opponents um, with such, you know, more um, articulated uh, tactics that again is not much of a merit, it's however just something that points out a much higher individual effort, right, to cope for the lack of broader collective measures. So, as we have observed, the development of the Couchet lags um, is associated with all a broader system of combat. The high saddle to remain much more firm on horseback. The straight legged riding position with your feet well into the stirrups, your leg muscles very tense just to absorb the impacts that were extremely hard we're talking about charges that were carried out at 45 kilometers per hour against other opponents that came at the same speed with that and we're talking about some hundreds of kilos launched at that speed um, into one another right and overall the most impacting thing of course is moral right because you have to fight against this convoi closely packed cavalry formations rather than the individual guys so you can imagine like the, the smashing power uh, entailed like today we have uh, intercontinental ballistic um, missiles we have tanks um, airplanes you know explosives of all kinds at, at that time literally the, the the most powerful punching force you had was these guys on earth 
right? They represent divine power unleashing his wrath on the unjust, right? And hence all the dual meaning. I made a video about uh, the Parseval's n definition about knights, that is, angels that kill everything they touch, right? That's how they conceive themselves, these French uh, knights. Um, so, an incredible physicality involved just to handle these beasts, the, the armor combat in itself was insane, insane, right? The single most noticeable Western European military um, way of the late 11th and 12th centuries, as we will see now, this was not, of course, the only place of this cavalry tactics were developed, but these topped, really, um, the scene, right? You still see, until the centuries, heavier and longer swords that were definitely the most important weapons, because after the charge you had to to fight anyway, like it wasn't immediately that easy, you had to actually to repeat charges multiple times in order to crush the enemy. And so for a while, not remaining too much entangled, especially among infantrymen, because the moment after the charge is the most dangerous in absolute terms. If somebody can't counterattack, you would have to, you know, to wield this sword, slashing, uh, beating the enemy like crazy, chopping heads, and you know, making all the the greatest slaughter you could be able to. Um, still, this uh, among cavalrymen, it was about unhinging like all the armor like damaging it as much as possible we needed to to deliver this trauma underneath the armor as well so we needed this massive blade right um and uh, regarding the conra tactics the uh unit tactics the that there is a debate regarding when this would have first been invented. It's a pointless one to me, right? Um, people base themselves a lot on archaeology and iconography, such as Nicole, were a bit obsessed with, with the idea that uh, everything, like uh, technological and whatever, would come from the East. That the Byzantines, that the Arabs had already the same type of um, cavalry tactics respectively from the 10th uh, and the 9th century. But as we've seen also in the video about the stirrup recently, what really is the turning point contemporarily across uh, these all these three cultures is the 8th century, right? And in great uh, many ways, they do proceed in parallel as far as their military development is concerned. Um, this is not to say that there weren't differences, but this is exactly the point. The West seems to have developed the single most homogeneous, compact, and, um, in fact, regular form of uh, feudal heavy cavalry warfare, um, simply because they were much more of a feudal society than the Byzantines uh, and, and the Arabs. And also when we look at the counter-element, just even infantry capacities, well, they seem to have been tougher, better equipped. Um, just they say it's difficult to resume in a few sentences the, the, the incredible boom that Western civilization had, say, between the 10th and the 13th century. Um, but I have other videos for this, in fact. In any case, basing yourself just on when, say, you have that mansion or archaeological find or uh, or depiction of a specific type of, of tactics or equipment, well, it doesn't mean that just because they're just a, a very few scanny ones, like that in the other places, this wasn't going on for some reason. So, the Byzantines had great cavalry, surely by the 10th century they topped um, armor technology to some extent because however they were developing for example the cataphracts in the system was however not feudal and it was sort of more prohibitive they used much lighter types of cavalry on average the Arabs too did not have a feudal society um, so that was some important Central Asian step influence the Seljuks were great knights on their own regard but I covered multiple crusade battles in the Near East, for example, and I think it's extremely clear that uh, 
the Westerners had the upper hand in combat, um, and especially because of their heavy cavalry. Their breeds were not inferior, nor in, you know, in the Carthusian um, estates uh, in, of France, nor the the the, the Castilian um, uh, tenures, right during the Reconquista, than the, you know, the, the, the Turkic or the or the Arab breeds that in part had been imported think about you know the berber horse of william the conqueror right but that still is not the single most important thing it's the system and the system was superior and i think that by charlemagne's times already the carolingians had a hell of a cavalry and even from before him from his grandfather um charles martel and so I again I have to make other videos explaining how, but um, again we don't have to be surprised that uh, the Franks, for example, have provided us with less iconographic or historical evidence than say the Byzantines or the Arabs. They're just different cultures; they express themselves differently. But this doesn't mean that, in fact, they go in parallel on the same issues, right? The Franks were much more brutal and primitive, but exactly for this reason also they took over uh, large swaths of Europe um, in a way that basically uh, nobody could afford to the extent they did with their own internal limits the, the empire collapses but also molding socially and militarily the system to produce this militas that eventually take over, do take over um, the Levant, they do take over the Byzantine Empire they, they basically overthrow Islam in, in, in southern Italy, in, in Spain, uh, they, they conquered. They, these are models copied by everybody around, by the Scandinavians that self-convert to Christianity and feudalism and in the Baltic Crusades, they're exported further. I mean, the Western Slavs adopt that, the Hungarians adopt it. I mean, it's, it's unavoidably and self-evidently and macroscopically the most successful civilizational impact that, that does start, indeed, by the post Carolingian kingdoms. Um, you know, in in parallel with this, and I particularly care about it because I focus much of my work, um, profession, say outside of here, on infantry warfare. Um, like when you have cavalry dominating, it's not just about cavalry dominating, right? These are not the steps. There are commoners, there are foot soldiers. As we've seen, even the knights were consistently dismounting and fighting uh, on foot. And there are, however, also anti-cavalry means that are used by the same uh, leaders of these armies. They are the same expression of this military elite, right? So never buy into the the incredibly um, unthoughtful concept that the Western feudal elite did not know what the infantry potential really was, right? Medieval knights knew much better than the same infantrymen what the infantry potential was actually about, even when they were defeated by infantrymen, right? Um, and the reason, especially in this feudal society, is that they handled them, they commanded them, they ordered them, they trained, they ordered, they, um, they, they equipped them as well other than just leading them in battle and integrating them tactically. Like, we, in a system that had always been happening, infantry and cavalry had always cooperated, and there was no other way of fighting, telling the truth, in the sedentary world. So, um, missile warfare does increase in parallel in importance. As we've seen before, um, most horses were notoriously not armored, apparently, or at least they had very uh, light uh, armor. And as such, they were quite vulnerable to projectiles in general. This would never bring to a situation in which missile warfare ever managed to stop cavalry. Right? Also, during the Hundred Years' War, who stopped cavalry were the men-at-arms. Right? In combined arms with the missile infantry that, however, had it been left alone in the battlefield, would have been completely raised by enemy cavalry. There was never the story like of an archer standing in front of a horseman taking him down. It would have happened individually, but on a large scale, tactics never, and I stress this, never worked like this in any single context ever. 
the, it literally did not exist. Nobody ever even thought of writing that. It's just uh, the imbecile modern mindset. They had to invent this because they had to ideologically, as hysterically, pretend that the lesser people had any decisiveness in all these things. They they didn't, just as they don't today. Um, um, and when you look at and this, this actually is a way to respect better those commoners, which I... Uh, actually estimate enormously given their capacities they knew what warfare was differently from most modern people and when you look at this French infantry I think that we should consider it much more in general just like all western infantry and say, considering also that the the challenges they faced not just on the battlefield but at home with this sort of you know psychological inferiority in which the elite had relegated them um, the, uh, the there were different areas of northern France that seemingly had more or less pronounced missile potential Normandy may have had some mm, missile um, increased missile capacity because the Norse had been making a substantial use of bows um, to protect their infantry formations. I, I'm not entirely sure that this is the case, but we indeed find... I mean, we tend always to underestimate how important infantry was in general. Like, there's a bit this this in English uh, infantry um, bias, I would say. I, I would, I'm not entirely sure it's completely a myth, but as we were saying before, I personally don't think that even if England or Normandy had had a slightly greater infantry bias, this actually reversed the... Of course, it didn't even come close to, but it didn't affect in a relevant way the, the cavalry preeminence in, say, feudal English warfare, for example. Um, there are lots of countries here that have a lot of strong uh, missile potential that are that is as powerful as this one, and also with very powerful cavalry. So I wouldn't I wouldn't say that even the greater archery bias ipso facto in relative terms means even to a greater one in absolute terms. Uh, for example, the Italians had very advanced missile warfare, very advanced infantry warfare. But they never dreamt of fighting with, without heavy cavalry because it would have been nonsensical, right? Just the, the Flemish town militias at some point having to fight against with very poor cavalry because they had sort of ousted the feudal element for political reasons would fight like just as infantrymen. Or the, the German Dithmarscher that were just a bunch of peasants. Um, or, I don't know, the Scots that had were much less of a feudal system than England, and so they had way disproportionately more infantrymen than heavy uh, cavalrymen, um, that still, the latter of which still, however, ruled. Um, so it's a very complex topic, and I discussed it in other uh, videos, but it, it is possible that Normandy was at least, let's put it in this way, uh, slightly less feudal than the French heartland, at, at least it had been with the Norse settlement, and so infantry potential in a bit m more in this regard given that cavalry has really an extra advantage to, in many ways may have had some greater archery bias of some sort. France also falls into the broader prevalence of crossbow archery in, in, in Western Europe, right? It is true that the English in this sense had more simple bows um, than, than the French and the reason why the crossbow eventually was more widespread and still as effective as as the in a in a broader tactical sense than than the bow contrary to what it again has been has been sort of enforced to you ideologically to, to believe um is um something i explain in other videos and it's a bit too long um in this case you see that the commoners do not threaten cavalry with this weapon anyway. The French tend again not to arm too much the, the peasantry and as we will see now they, they tend to specialize in their own sort of um, 
you know, this mainly heavy cavalry, uh, um, soldiery. But these guys are on foot are always necessary, right? Um, and they do contribute to challenge the same cavalry on, on many occasions. I mean, these uh, armies fighting within France, saying, you know, the, the clashes between the Capetians and the Angevins are French versus French, right? And they fight with all weapons that, in this sense, are uh, symmetrical. They are the same countries practically in terms of material culture. Nothing really changes. So um, the specular conventional symmetry of these uh, troops um, entails a cooperation between infantry and cavalry. The importance of crossbowmen is in, goes in parallel indeed with the one of mounted infantry at the same time. This is often overlooked. Uh, from the late 12th century the knightly retinues tend to have this mounted crossbow and I, I made a video about the unit type specifically because it's very very overlooked right they were regularized in many areas of Europe from this century and somehow they pass um, unnoticed and they're very interesting they're not prevalent they're sort of picked units of sort um, and they uh, they are also well paid largely professionals they are first known as um, through the um, uh, the office of the Grand Master of Crossbowmen that was rules for the foot ones um, in France uh, for the first time in 1230 right plate armor surely developed as a consequence of the greater challenges that these weapons pose to cavalry but not entirely like the idea again that missile warfare would have decisively changed the way warfare went is, is not is not correct you need plate armor just because people would try to throw things at you including swords and everything so it's not the crossbow bolt that just per se a uh, devil but but it does contribute um, of course what is rather um, underrated is the heavy infantry potential to some extent we have some evidence of this. For example, at the Cathedral of Autun, we have a carved capital dating to the 20s, the 30s of the 12th century, uh, depicting the flight into Egypt. And Joseph is armed with a large single edged blade mounted on a short, thick half. Um, we do not know how this weapon would have come to be it may have stemmed out of a single edged but long haft uh, war site of some sort um, which would have in turn evolved during the 13th century into the falchion but these are a bit speculative assertions also because we do not understand too well how this weapon is is made but these weapons did exist. They were evidently stemming from a peasant background. These were often modeled out of uh, working tools. Um, and this does show how, after all, in commoners were armed to, to some extent that could be dangerous, especially against, uh, for example, armor at close range, even though these guys, again, would prefer to have this hafted weapons to, to stay distant from especially the knights because they you know they, but from any blade in general because they they weren't affluent enough to armor themselves effect at the cathedral of winchester england but i had to insert it because it's basically um received um by um tournay where fonts were carved from the hard black stone uh, coming from there is the in fact carved relief on a font of the life of Saint Nicholas uh, which would display an early say a version of the bearded axe extending down and back from a point level with the place where its sleeve went over the haft it's similar to the one we've seen before um, this type of weapon was at this point popular in central eastern Europe would have evolved into 
um, you know, to the Burdich, uh to, to some at some point in history. Um, and in this, however, Western and context, and also in, in Scandinavia, um, the war axis would develop in a different way, right? With an upward sweeping edge. Uh, that is essentially the one you start seeing from the 10th, 11th century, the most typically named Danish axe. Um, the differences, again, are not so relevant here in as much as understanding how these weapons were, of course, f used on foot, like maybe by knights, but still on foot. Uh, I made a video about the Battle of Bouteroud that um, illustrates this um, infantry capacity in Normandy, for example, even by, you know, relatively well-armed uh, milites on foot, however. We have at the Municipal Library of Saint-Omer uh, the manuscript 12 slash second and um, at uh, folio 62 verso we have a drawing uh, showing infantry combat. Uh, this manuscript dates to the late 12th century. We are in northern France um, and the scene here is most likely a trial by battle sort of context um, with specialized non-lethal weapons. Right, I made a video about uh, trial by combat, especially the relief of that um, unknown grave uh, at Mal Malvern Abbey that was likely a champion, possibly a champion for these um, trials that just did that by profession. And we see in this case instead uh, two figures wielding mace-like objects that are uh, accompanied with egg-shaped shields of sword. Um, and this type of weapon uh, was even again in, during the trial used uh, on by foot soldiers. But it doesn't mean that it was just relegated to judicial occasions, right? This could have been just a type of armament more common among um, the lesser people that maybe was allowed, for example, by the authorities because it was not challenging towards the elite, right? Weapons that would have easily been outclassed by the knightly ones, and so these guys could have it for their own private affairs as freemen, uh, including battling against one another in this judicial context. In the cathedral treasury of Van, we find a painted wooden marriage chest depicting the story of Tristan. We are here in the Duchy of Brittany, between the 50s and the 70s of the 12th century. The scene depicts Tristan and Moro fighting. Now the helmets and the swords are regular, while the shields are very large, and this makes us think that they were designed for foot soldiers. They could be some forms of mantlets uh, or pavises, and there would be a lot to talk about this. Uh, they're not canonic pavises, maybe mantlets uh, in the way they may have employed even in siege warfare being fixed on the ground. The, the history of the pavises is a bit more complicated than people realize, but we will surely make some video about the shield. The, I talk about it in Medieval Shield um, introduction but some unit types, especially from these early centuries, would be sort of more eloquent in many ways. Um, they could be Talevas shields that were mm, specifically designed to protect infantry from arrows in some ways. Um, given that we are in Brittany, it was perhaps a bit more of missile warfare, but it's difficult to explain how and why these types of shields would have been around because normally in the Celtic range the reaction to increased missile uh, power is other missile power, right? And having larger shields can be a thing if they are particularly light, but we do not see a great deal of this in the West, right? Because generally speaking the darts were also 
heavy as much as the armor that generally speaking in the west you have like just recently we were talking about how uh, I think it was Armenian warfare or something I don't remember how certain uh, um, Korean warfare actually um, yes the other day regarding you know having pretty large but weaker shields employed against especially step archery that threw lots of arrows but they weren't so dramatically powerful individually as we think so in all in all we can't really say like crossbow fire may have been dangerous enough but we do not see this type of weapon of this type of shields much around in the same time if not like as panels for during warfare not really for individual soldiers but uh, here it's also depicted, so it's interesting anyway. Um, during the 12th century, uh, we see uh, a process of specialization and professionalization in the French army that is happening a bit more, a, a bit everywhere, like along the patterns of the, s the same broader Frankish legacy in Europe. And in the 13th century, this process um, completes itself like this is the peak of medieval civilization of feudal warfare of cavalry strength um, uh, you have uh, the the knight the mounted knight becoming the standard type of warrior in a core sense you have even the older squires getting heavier and basically becoming undistinguishable from their masters and in fact, you see now also essentially mercenary companies taking the place of the feudal levy. I made a video about the 13th century French men at arms recruitment that explains this. Um, so the vassalatic beneficiary system declines, and the knights basically now are hired as uh, rank and file heavy cavalry by the more powerful noblemen. They are aristocrats themselves and they identify with this profession of arms. They would maintain the backbone of the French army actually quite beyond this time. In, in the 18th century we have seen how it's really the, uh, the lesser aristocracy in France that maintains the real standards of the French royal army. right? As the higher nobility is ever more detached from, from that and that service and the bourgeoisie wants to enter but they're not as good as the traditional nobility um, you definitely see lots of mercenaries in the royal as well as the, in the princely armies these are in many ways the same descendants of the older barons that sort of now uh, fought for a pay on their own right and they had still feudal obligations uh, of course as French subjects but they were freer and just it was easier for the same king to have to keep the, the entire system going on hiring them in this other way um, Greece um, a typical example from the all-in war against the Angevins that at the beginning of the 13th century would culminate with the Battle of Bouvine um, about a force maintained now in a uh, in a, not in a permanent sense that would not really occur until uh, the following century but still for a prolonged time um, the def king of France uses on the Norman border we are in 1202-1203 and this is a small um, but professional army of the period it costs but it's qualitative and it's fairly typical, after all, of what both the French and English were doing, but particularly the Capetians were now systematically adopting this way of war and would expand it ever, ever, ever more after uh, the Battle of Bouvine. This force consists of 257 knights, 267 mounted sergeants, right, 80 mounted crossbowmen, 133 infantry crossbowmen and about 2,000 infantry sergeants. I made a video about the sergeants, um, multiple ones, both the crusader ones and the mounted ones that fit uh, exactly this context, right? And they were basically 
at this point perhaps at the beginning of the 13th century not quite as as much as the knights but there were still you see here even the the, the numbers they are one to one practically so there is a subordination to the knights but it's it's not such that you can't simply dismiss and they're sort of homogenizing you see the smaller number of crossbowmen both on horseback and on foot there's a great proportion of mounted ones um, and uh, say that the foot ones are not even double and then you have 2000 infantry sergeants which are a bit like the bases you need for for sieges for just uh, allowing the cavalry to operate and to support it as an auxiliary force etc um, and you have uh, these are royal troops specifically and you have then other 300 unspecified additional mercenaries alongside them which were evidently uh, available just at the um, uh, court of the sovereign that moved together with, especially with the treasury um, that was a way to attract um, these guys knowing that at the end of the campaign they would have been paid and or that they would have kept receiving uh, an income that that was not going away or it's a sort of a magnet to attract all kind of uh, renegades of again also political opponents that could uh, switch side uh, etc so it's very interesting to see how the king of france was operating uh, with these troops exactly while sending as we were saying that traditional vassal levies to the south not as a military service but simply like with a green light to do a bit whatever they wanted how much they could grab in the in southern france that was just another country it was just another place uh, where people spoke a different language and basically the northerners didn't care anything about um, and that's very important because even though Simon de Montfort, their leader, was killed, um, so making the the entire scenery that had created in southern France collapse, all of the sudden, still Occitania was devastated by uh, the campaign, the war, and it's so exhausted that eventually it's incorporated by the French later on in the 13th century. Um, as far as Flanders was concerned, there were lots of mercenary troops, as we were saying before, but the counterculture um, mercenaries of the time, more specialized in infantry warfare against cavalry, which was some strange uh, religious ideas at times, um, and that had been making their own uh, experiments in knights butchering at home mostly through ambushes not really open field engagements right but all um, ways that uh, were in fact mirrored by the the sacrifice that they made at Bouvines in the Anglo-German army against uh, against the the same Capetians as they let uh, they, they they were slaughtered till till the last man after having been surrounded as they didn't want to to give up right infantry was not yet capable of defeating cavalry alone so the, it was really their death sentence but they they would try at least and they passed down to history as one of the most you know uh, clamorous infantry resistance um, during those centuries the French kept hiring mercenaries uh, from Flanders well into the 14th century many of these guys were bourgeois they came from the the towns and the guild based militia system uh, which was fairly effective um, in the rest of France as we've seen there wasn't much um, manpower coming from the cities uh, per se I mean, I mean the the local militias did exist and they could defend their own their own centers but they were not thought to be you know, particularly enterprising troops. It would be levied, right? Uh, French infantry continued to play a vital role during so the first part of the 14th century. Um, there was, with the 
mid 14th century crisis of course uh, further decline this was true for all of Europe um, and later in around this time as well you find however troops coming from more fringe areas such as the southwest of France uh, think about Gascony uh, and the javelin armed light infantry known as Bido that came from there these were skirmishers essentially so not really heavies that would hold the ground against cavalry but in many ways they were very rough peoples coming from some depressed um, mountaineers communities that uh, were quite loaded and so they would know how to risk their lives and do their job and they could be very effective also in skirmishing in um, in ambushes and scouting all this stuff and difficult terrain I think during the hundred years war during the friend the, the English chevauche and so all this also mounting dismounting etc um, the English had their same the same troops down the troop uh, the French uh, have um, perhaps slightly later development of uh, gunpowder firearms uh, the reason perhaps being the traditional aristocratic uh, distrust towards again some any weapon that could be going against the the establishment uh, we see some of the first so most famous employment in French hands in 1338 of these new technology they're often mentioned in the 40s but uh, of the same century but let's say this is normal for all over Europe my my guess is that France was a bit less of an industrial um, urban uh, reality than than others uh, where uh, artillery develops earlier also in smaller centers pick Italy for example but it's also a matter of documentation so we have seen how even very depressed areas have pretty easily pretty pretty soon this technology available of course they develop it less um, also especially in quantity but um, it spreads essentially in the same uniformly all over Europe independently from the intensity naturally I'm very uh, generic here we made other videos about the period but we haven't even began to scratch surface of French warfare uh, during these centuries so again th these videos are just propedeltic to a further dive into the various specificities but before finishing this rather long video I would like to delve a little bit into the Saracen iconography from uh, French sources connected evidently with the uh, participation in the crusades of many uh, northern French knights. In the church of La Madeleine in Vézelay, we have some carved capitals dating to the, in fact, to the 20s of the 12th century, the church. Um, in, we are in the Duchy of Burgundy, right? And we find some figures like the infidel in combat with a the knight, then Goliath, that, as you know, is represented often as a Saracen against the good um, biblical, of course, um, king and uh, what have to become at least through this combat. Um, in, of course, in all this art, there is some sort of stereotyping on the Moor and the Saracen in ways that are less accurate, opologically, than the, of course, the much more... Uh, easily representable, much better known, uh, local uh, French arms and armor in this case. Um, we see, for example, the infidel having a leaf-shaped sword, uh, which is clearly depicted in this way to differentiate it from the Christian weapons. All right, These are early forms of blades that were mostly cutting oriented for targets that were softer so aside from the stereotyping um, there is some 
sort of truth in as much that say Islamic warfare at this point was on average lighter um, than than the French one, the Western one in general. Um, and so perhaps the French that had this heavier equipment tended, especially on, as far as heavy cavalry was concerned, would tended to to stress these differences. Um, so there is a bit of truth and a bit of exaggeration, but but still, we know how French warfare affected is, uh, Islamic panoplies throughout the Mediterranean, for example. So the infidel, still in this representation, has a male cap. He also has a small kite-shaped shield with an angled axis that is similar but one of um, of a uh, depicted in a crusader church in Nazareth. Uh, we will see it um, in some other video specifically dedicated to the Ultramar states. Um, David and Goliath are more uh, regular. They both have long sleeved male hauberks. They don't have quaff. Um, they have broad swords hanging from belts rather than baldrics. The shields are the large kite shaped type we see it visually. Helmets are a bit different. They are conical, all of them. Fluted, they have slightly curved lower rims. Also chin straps that pass uh, directly through small extensions at uh, the sides of, of the same helmet. We do not know whether this choice is say specifically dictated by the awareness of this type of of um, of straps, of chin straps, examples, or if they were just trying to say, okay, let's do something strange because it's sort of more like exotic in some way. At the Municipal uh, Library of Arras, we have an illustrated Bible dating to the early 11th century, which speaks a lot of Carolingian vibes um, here. In fact, there is um, the, the manuscript is quite archaic in the in the art in the, in the type of panoply. In fact, you have this large round shield um, thrust over arm in a um, very old fashion with a pen-on spear. Uh, the helmet is conical and segmented in construction. And the most interesting thing about this is that. The helmet has a male aventail, which you do not find in this part of Europe much. Actually, this would be more frequent than one probably expects. Um, and it, it is possible that this manuscript was copying a Byzantine original of some sort, so adopting part of the the iconography from uh, from that art. But it's also possible, given that they are really similar, that this aventail was um, of the same type of depicting specifically a guy from Eastern Europe um, and or possibly Hungary that would make use in fact of such type. At the church of Our Lady of Dundermont, today is Belgium, you have a carved relief on a font uh, depicting the visions of the saint, the saints uh, Peter and Paul. We are in the county of Flanders in the early mid 12th century. And the interesting aspect of this is that um, the figure represented uh, as Saint Paul with his companions, while he lies, you know, fulgurated on the road to Damascus, has a normal long sleeved. Holberg, but on his head his helmet is made of this archaic construction that connects it to northern Europe so we have seen already this connection before um, as it is essentially made by two pieces joined by a central comb and reinforced by a band around the rim All right. These elements are quite archaic and again truly represent a northern European influence uh, of sort. We've seen this 
uh, also in the in medieval England the same years so there is you know, like a sort of migration here a relic of helmet construction that had survived among the Scandinavians in the north portal of the Chartres Cathedral we find some carved reliefs depicting Goliath and the Philistines these are uh, so I'm talking all examples that are supposed by the way to represent scientifically something exotic right it's not just okay I come from this place so I necessarily receive this influence these are this is art so they they wanted to represent something that seemed exotic enough and maybe they had something at hand that even in Flanders I don't know was associated with with the Scandinavians the Vikings etc and so they wanted it to be here something different uh, St. Paul here is fulgurated so in the moment in which he converts to Christianity was he wasn't a Christian yet um, so Goliath and the Philistines here we're at the beginning of very beginning of the 13th century we see a lot of uh, stereotyping however Goliath especially wears an armor that is based definitely on Byzantine art right it shows a scale cuirass with laminated upper arm defenses which is you know, fairly accurate if you transpose it to, for example, a Byzantine context. So, this may surely have received, uh, especially on the Chartres reliefs, like a, you know, some important input from people who had been at the Crusades. This is just uh, one year after, essentially, the 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 French Venetian sack of Constantinople. So, it may be not a coincidence. Um, in the central tympanum of the Church of La Madeleine that we've seen before at Vézelay, uh, beginning of the 12th century, we have a carved relief depicting the races of mankind. And this show uh, affect different peoples and how they thought um, these races were characterized by. Right? And some are sort of uh, inspired to classical antiquity as well. For example, there are the Lydians, right? that um, are showed as this primitive people using just uh, um, simple bows, not even composite ones like the Easterners. These were just uncivilized huntsmen, savages, and represented like this. Uh, we see a long bow, um, which was absolutely present in Western Europe everywhere regularly, and just here it's used because it was you know, it's a larger bow than the average, and the point is always that the bow is here. These guys basically are just light infantry. The the idea of this Lydian archetype. There are two supposed Italians that wield some very strange hooked spears that could signify some sort of, um, I would say, general development of. Uh, Italian weapons, especially used against armored opponents that at the time were really uh, used heavily by also foot militas uh, in northern Italy in very also fortified contexts, etc. Some have said that these could be sailors' weapons, so that's why the Italians were represented like this, wielding both hooks of some sort, which, which is also possible. Uh, but in general, again, I believe that the pretty strong Lombard infantries of, of the same years would have left the impression that these were actually uh, footmen capable of unhorsing cavalrymen uh, pretty pretty effectively. This weapon could be even the uh, the forerunner of a hellbard because um, they seem to have a trusting capacity. As well, it's not entirely clear, uh, of course, in the details, right? Um, we see uh, also some Saracens armored, for example, in the same guise of the Crusaders, which, which is fascinating because, of course, there were Saracens that had, you know, 
pretty equivalent armor to the Western one in terms of general protection and complexity. So it's interesting that they would represent them in that fashion, so not lagging behind to the Westerners. From the um, Bibliothèque de la Ville, uh, Palais des Arts uh, in Lyon, we have uh, a manuscript of the history of Ultramer, was mm, realized in Paris in the last years of the 13th century. This is the manuscript 29. And uh, in the folio 7 verso, we find a depiction of the Battle of Antioch, the First Crusade, um, in which crusaders wear round-topped great helms, which is pretty much in tune for the 13th century. The interesting part being the Muslims wielding falchions. That um, is a bit strange, but because we do not see much of that in the Levant, but this could have been the mental adaptation of a French artist to the knowledge. This guy you know, illuminating the manuscript was not a soldier, but he may have heard, of course, that the Turks used curved blades. And so he thought, what curved blades do we do exist? And, of course, in France, there were falchions. And so he gives this Islamic fighters the falchion, uh, the French way, which is accurate and inaccurate at the same time, you see. Then at the British Library of London we have an Histoire Universelle from France, this is sure dated to the early 14th century. Um, it's a bit of a fantasy picture, telling the truth. In any case, you see horse archers in heavily armored fashion, right? The great helms match with the contemporary. 14th century uh, versions. Uh, we see one abandoned on the ground with the united chin strap, which uh, in fact was really used at the time uh, for for the great helm, but that you hardly have this, the chance of see in this in this perspective. Um, so horse archers again. Every man at arm knew how to use a bow on on horseback, like they hunted all the time when they were not at war. So that was the the main. Just you would really not see this r that frequently on a battlefield, especially in the 14th century. It would have been much more frequent, say in the 12th, in the 11th. Um, at this point, it's just more of some sort of license. I mean, there are such things even for the the 15th century, right? So, but it it could be realistic to some extent. Um, we have the if the effigies of, at the Abbey of Fontevraud, dating to the early 13th century. They are the most important early Gothic tombs, depicting such great um, figures like King Henry II of England and King Richard the first of England. Uh, we have two swords uh, included in these carvings. Um, they have a naturally short key on. It could be an artistic mm, incompetence ju just per se. The sword of Richard the first has straight key on. Um, there is a small octagonal pommel. The sword of Henry the second has a diamond shape pommel instead and short down turn key on. It may be influenced by Spanish uh, fashion design in some way. Henry was also Duke of Gascony. Uh, I made a video about just recently well okay Edward the second much you know later descendant um, government of Gascony, but I made a video also about the Duchy of Gascony, and so it's possible that um, some influence had arrived from there artistically. I wanted to insert the beautiful illustrations, I mean I did in the pictures, but here in the in the uh, iconographic analysis from the Mathieu 
Yovsky Bible that however you will find this verse as it already is in many 13th century sort of standard Western European military historical unit videos uh, because uh, I mean there is so much evidence that in order to have it fit in a video like this um, it should have lasted I don't know five hours but um, you know pretty much what I selected for this video is the the basics right so there are no surprises of of sort of course the the Bible in itself has a lot of that um, exceptions as well but it's still it's something that generic enough let's say to to say well this could have been any place in Western Europe to some extent just know that it's also and primarily French right it shows an enormous variety of troops that again I already made individual videos on it, specific troop types depicted and so I don't think it was important to insert specifically in here right here I wanted to concentrate most of what you could about the essentials about Western Frankish warfare at this point in history I would conclude with um, an 18th century drawing the um, the former Monument de la Monarchie Françoise published in Paris in 1729 um, of the tragically lost um, stained glass windows from Saint-Denis dating to the mid 12th century and illustrated were there at the time of course and illustrated the, the first crusade right uh, needless to say you know these things were lost during the French Revolution but that's also history now you have to accept it uh, if you want to understand history in the first place unfortunately or fortunately who knows um, now these are again 18th century drawings of a 12th century also stained glass drawing right so we have to be careful in saying okay well it it was like this right very often if you look at modern copies from the ancient it, it, it's all very sketchy and or evenly influenced by the current artistry because they were trying to embellish it as if it would look more like the art that existed at the time of course the 18th century was a bit more scientific in its proceedings so we can trust at least the essentials we see symmetrical conical helmets without nozzles long-sleeved uh, male hauberks and kite shaped shields uh, here we're talking figures um, uh, like the Crusaders like specifically and uh, their weapons are spears and swords everything pretty standard the Muslims seem to have been more varied right and specifically they are seemingly divided between Turks and Arabs of some sort this is possible for example the Anatolian Turks and I'm about to make a video about them actually they're much more similar to the Crusaders which is extremely accurate historically speaking because the Sultanate of Rome had a, an enormous Western influence not just from obviously Rome uh, the Byzantine territories that had occupied but from the Frankish troops as well I also made a video about this they had literal Franks fighting in, in their own armies, so literal French at the time lived there, so it's also fascinating uh, to think that the the, the actual uh, if this is the real connection, the actual stained glass windows from Saint-Denis that is the symbol of France would take into consideration such a thing, who knows, maybe it was even a matter of pride, say, look, these guys basically are similar, like they they are imitating us specifically they need us even in arms and armor in, in soldiers in mercenaries right even though they are the bad guys of course um, they the only difference with the Crusaders perhaps they're going too far um, the only difference however in the art depicted is that the Muslims have round helmets which maybe however 
accurate as well, especially concerning a form of neck, a neck extension that we do find among the, the Anatolian Turks, and not just, but in, in the region, uh, indeed. All right. We see um, one wearing a lamellar cuirass, for example, this, this is a heavier type. Um, lamellar and male are given, um, this was in the first uh, image then, for the Battle of Derylium, the famous Battle of Derylium, uh, the f in during the First Crusade. The Anatolian Turks have both lamellar and male, which is also correct. Right? Um, the same goes for the Turks at the Battle of Antioch. Uh, even though um, a scale Holberg is present also in here. Then there is a differentiation from the Arab Egyptian troops for the the sieges of Jerusalem and Ascalon that are represented consciously differently from the main Turkic powers. So again, there is surely something behind this. Uh, it's it's not random. They did it on purpose. Um, the, mm, there are small round shields. Apparently these guys have a shaven head for some reason. A guy seems to um, ride barefoot, perhaps without stirrups, which may be a reference to some ethnic contingent that the, um, the Fatimids were employing uh, from from North Africa and made a bit about the Fatimid army and we'll talk more about the various mercenary uh, ethnic uh, contingents right this guy the same guy has a tassel or thong from the pommel of, of his sword then there is a scene in which the Egyptians uh, uh, take refuge into Ascalon and they are at least there is one guy who seemed to be using kilted armor of some sort. Um, so almost all of these features are actually seen in Islamic arms and armor of the same period. So again, there was surely a, a, an importantly accurate information behind this artistry. Um, the most plausible answer is that the artist that made the sketches for the stained glass would have received the descriptions written or oral by the clergy and the, the crusaders, the knights uh, alike, that participated to the expedition in the first crusade. Um, so this is definitely a much more accurate representation of a Moor and a Saracen in the way they were sometimes absurdly and exotically stereotyped in later sources. And this could be the actual reason, uh, which entails also a lot of pride, as you understand, as far as these guys are. We were there. We want to represent how these, these, um, these enemies really were, so that in the stained glasses we are actually representing the truth. Um, and we this increases uh, its its worth its its relevance, right? So um, this is um, an incredibly uh, different um, idea from, say, a primitive backwardness or whatever. I mean, Saint Denis is is France, right? Remember, there was no such thing. As France outside of San Denis, you know the meaning that it has and that we were talking about at the beginning. Alright, so we have made actually a pretty long video, um, and uh, this really was deserved for Northern France. We really made lots of videos about medieval French, uh, medieval France in general, but medieval French warfare um, that I think it's. Uh, is we should. should talk about much more often than we do probably we will, we will increase some sort of military historical only 21 videos here I see in my playlist it's too few definitely, we should make much more and make too few about medieval friends
so I'm glad to make these videos because they really help a lot. And I think that this video will become some sort of cornerstone for further, uh, like for, for all the other videos I want to make about the various unit types, battles, tactics, army organization, arms and armor, whatever. Uh, for today, however, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. As always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.